Hey, welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. Uh, back here with another episode. Today I have a special guest, Paul Hill from PSMS, Puget hey, Sound Mycological Society. And if you're on Facebook, like in the forums, uh, you're probably familiar with Paul Hill. He's always got some witty comments and good identification and stuff like that. Do you do the, um, do you do like the poison control one? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on poison control there. That's, uh, that's always a hectic thing about this time of year. Oh my goodness. What causes the most poisonings in this area? In the I don't know about these. Uh, the poison help is all, all over the world. Um, and it's a lot of people who are freaked out about their dog eating something because they don't <laughs> they don't know anything about the mushrooms. Uh, but every once in a while, we got more serious cases where there's a child who's eaten you know something that actually contains poisons. And we do plants and mushrooms, so we got you know 50 people who know everything about plants, and they're you know impress all about our mushroom guys. And then the plant guys are going, "How did you identify that? Holy! You know they do everything from." Uh, mushroom, uh, mushrooms in some dogs vomit to, uh, you know. My kid had this in his hand. Yeah, a kid in his hand, there was, it, you know, like took a bite, you know, is it bad, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it runs the range. Yeah. And this time of year we get 50, 60, 70 a day. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a busy place uh, in the fall. Maybe a little less in the Pacific Northwest this year because we don't get any, have any rain. Yeah, it's uh, a little tough for mushrooms. And so today we're in the uh, Grand Forest here on Bainbridge Island. Yeah. We're just gonna go take a walk and see what kind of interesting mushrooms we can find. And are, you're an administrator in that poison control group? Uh, the, uh, people who comment and ID have to be administrators. That's how we run it. Oh, we, okay. Facebook is weird, you can't limit it. You can't have a page that the, somebody who needs help can post on and then it, other people can I, limit the people who can ID. You just have to say admins only and, and delete the comments from other people and that's... It's probably a smart way to go. It's sort of a manual operation, but it we, because we have 200 administrators, we get the job done. So You're an admin on other identification groups and stuff on Facebook? I think I've limited myself to only a couple more, but I, I've subscribed to more than I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so anyways, too, huh? that's kind of proof Paul knows what he's talking about and I've been following him on Facebook. He did a cool talk about morels hunting down burn morels for our, uh, the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society last fall, or yeah. last spring. So that was helpful and we uh, got a lot out of that. So thanks for joining. If you're new to the channel, we talk about wild mushrooms here. So we're just gonna walk down the path and just talk about what we find. And uh, if you like videos like this, give a thumbs up, make sure to subscribe to the channel and uh, leave a positive comment. So there's you go. That, that's your folio, do I think? What do we got? Wow, look at that. I think there's a folio there. Yeah. Oh, one of those. Um, they always nice ones on on the wood with the with the uh, scales. If we look down here, we see the scales on this type. Am I getting that on? Yeah. Yeah. yeah those ones are kind of like whitish, huh? Or do you think that's Foliota squarosa group? Yeah, yeah, that sounds sounds right. What do you what do you know about edibility of these? Squirm I I think there's some people who've tried that. Uh, I don't know. I never heard any great flavor on them, but uh, they are related to the namaco, which is a pretty popular cultivated edible in uh, in China. There's another little fruiting right here. So. Yeah, wood eaters. I think there's some big ones down. There are. Oh, there. oh yeah. yeah. We got some bigger ones here. Nice. So the Foliota uh, squarosa group, here. I think more commonly known to cause GI upset. Yeah. I, uh, probably not I recommended. Had some discussion of one of them, but versus the other ones, I mean, that's pretty old, huh? Well, it's yeah. amazing considering how dry we've been all summer with the record setting dryness and. Here's some pretty good clusters that came out oh, yeah. days ago, weeks ago. Here's some Tremita, Tremides, uh, or maybe Sterium. Uh, I couldn't tell you at that stage. Yeah. That's pretty rough. It looks like it did have pores. I bet it was a Tremides versicolor, a turkey tail. Mm. But these Foliota, they grow in big clusters like this on dead wood, but probably not 
Not one yeah. for the basket, huh? No, it, more of the for, for the photographer. They are beautiful. Uh, huh? Naturalists, you can really get some pretty uh, foliotas because of the gold color and the, the interesting flakes and things. That... Beautiful, foliota squarosa. Yep, now yeah, that's where I go with that. There's a couple more of the foliota. Yeah. These ones are very scaly. Yeah. They're just more mature than those other ones. And they're gonna have kind of a medium brown spore print. Yeah. Always growing on dead wood like this. So this is a hardwood, probably like maple. Mm. Just laying on the side of the trail. Beautiful photographer mushrooms though. Right, right. And you can always, if you're in the rainforest, you can tell it's a, <laughs> it's a solid. Can you identify this tree from the bark? It's, <laughs> it's a little what, tough with the moss on it. Yeah, which, which means the moss is covering your, the hardwood here. That turns out to be, looks like an alder, but it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is an alder. They got those football shaped leaves. But, One way you can tell the older maples, uh, they, they're often mossy too, but they have licorice ferns that grow yeah, off the sides of like them. Glossy, uh, identifying trees by which fern takes over the side <laughs> of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at how beautiful the grand forest is down here, though. Look at this nice light here. Yeah, big, big open canopy under here. So, uh, this is kind of cool habitat to forage in because I can see a long ways. And especially for like a chicken of the woods, you know, we can oh, see yeah. that spray of orange like way yeah, off in the forest. Right. Oh boy, oh, I was uh, up on the Mountain Loop Highway a couple years ago. And looked up the steep slope and there was a giant six foot set of shelves of uh chicken of the, of woods. Chicken of the woods and and i'm crazy up uh, climbing over <laughs> three foot like trying to navigate detouring around three foot fallen logs and you know it's like it took me like take 20 minutes to get up to the tree heck yeah <laughs> i'll go to the distance for those for sure yeah, yeah. i've taped a knife onto a stick we've thrown rocks on the beach at Rialto Beach, there was one way up in a tree, and we were throwing chunks of wood. There's mushrooms out, you know. It rained hard. Not hard. It rained a little bit, like, a couple weeks ago. Right, we got that one Thursday storm. Yeah, yep. And I think uh, it was enough to just kick off a few things. Not a lot, but... You can see the mud, and sometimes you just got to hang near the streams and see what you can find. Yeah, good areas for uh, things like oyster mushrooms, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, whatever we were. I saw some high paloma yesterday. Yeah, okay, that's not very exciting, but if you're not finding anything on a dry day, you take what you can get. Right. There's color in the forest. Oh, look. What's that? I don't know. I'm not very good at crusts. I haven't worked their way up. But it's uh, getting a little gutation going. It's actually... I call it mushroom sweat. <laughs> is that what it is? It's actually from the metabolism of the mushroom, so sort of technically it's kind of like sweat. <laughs> is it sweat or is it pee? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be yeah. I'd, I'd call it more compared to sweat because it's coming out of the different pores. That coming That's out of the point. side of the, of the skin. <laughs> That's a good point. I don't think we could, yeah, no, there's no kidney involved at all. <laughs> Yeah, just mushroom metabolites. It's essentially just water, and you could lick that. If you're really thirsty for some fresh, clean water in the forest, you could lick those. Being that this is an old Douglas fir stump, I'd venture to bet that's just foamy topsis, uh, panicula, or the, we call it Mountier here in the Northwest. Probably just the start of a brown rot decayer, like the red belted conch, so. Look at that, look at how thick that bark is. This is a nice old tree. Yeah, it is. We could count and see how old, how old it is. Yeah. 125. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I'd say 128. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got growing on the end of the logs here? These are super common, huh? Yeah, that's, uh, the official mushroom of uh, Puget Sound or something, uh, the Fomatopsis. It's so common. I was out, uh, a friend of mine was uh, mushrooming back east and he didn't see enough Fomatopsis and he thought it was weird because it's so common in these parts. Right. We got the two, the, the our version of the red belted conch, and the one without a belt. So that would be what the the saggy pants mushroom, polypora, <laughs> because it doesn't have a belt. You know. Ah, oh, good one, yeah, good yeah, one. Yeah. 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 But okay. nobody's going with that common I think, name. Nah. <laughs> Foamy tops of Socratia, maybe. Yeah. Right. Right. Saggy That's pants. the one without the <laughs> saggy pants. Without the belt. <laughs> I like that. 
so the yeah the red well so i used to think it meant it had a red belt and some of them seem too but i think what it means is that the conch is red and it's belted red and belted the conch one gets darker on top and then the, there's the orange or red on the strip on the outside what do people use these for what are they i think people some uh, uh make tinctures and extracts out of them but i i don't really know what the what the uh, goal there is or what they you know what they're you know they're medicinal they, right? medicinal use of you know i can't say that i'm not a big medicinal person so yeah that's not really people lay claim that they're medicinal uh, uh, maybe they're generalizing on another one that is or something right it's all the same. No. but they're really important to the ecology out here they break down all these logs yeah and it's you you really only see them on dead logs the foresters wouldn't really count it as a pathogen they're worried about the ones that are digging into the the just barely a diseased tree like a uh, honey mushrooms notorious for like whoa look at that nice tree and it's got honeys oh no that tree's gonna die you know? yeah yeah these are you're not gonna if you see these growing on a tree it's dead right yeah, I mean, just, it's, like here we have a log and sometimes standing oh yeah down there we got a big cluster of them but we look up that tree and that's just a snag. There's yep. nothing alive. It Small is. Down. It's dead. Yeah, yeah, it's tall. That is a, what we refer to as a widow maker. Yeah, don't camp under that one. No. <laughs> but yeah, you see those those shelf mushrooms. Pretty, essentially, you see mushrooms growing on the side of any tree. It's kind of a sign the tree is on the way out at least, yeah, right? I guess there's a whole succession of the different polypores. That you know, ones will ones attack early, and others are like so late in the game. I'm trying to think of one that's uh, that uh, it just shows up at the end, where the, when the, the log mm. is all crunchy and you know, it's yeah. there, like you step on it, and it's falling apart. I've seen tremedes, like a turkey tail, act kind of parasitic, or I guess parasitoid because it sort of kill it. It kills its host. Mm. The phallus schweinitzi, those can be parasitic. Yeah, well, they're on, yeah, but they're in the, in the forest floor, and you can't hardly tell what they're growing on. It's so right broken down, and it's on logs, but they're usually ones you could, like, kick with your foot and it's break true. it up. I think they're, they're, uh, they're pretty equal opportunity. Yeah, and then they... They're very common this year. We might run into one. If so. you, uh... The folks, uh, your local uh, conservation group's doing trail work and they're cutting down the alders and throwing them on the edge of the trail. That's how you find your tremedes. They, a couple years in, a nice old log, they start growing along the edge of your trail. For sure. If you had, if you had a little advice for like somebody new to foraging, how would you tell them to navigate a forest like this? Like, stay on the trails, head out into the bush. What? Well, it's uh, that's one of the problems with uh, foraging is. Uh, is uh, most of us don't go off trail for any reason and this is like a common way of people who aren't climbing mountains or rock climbing or hardcore orienteering and we start getting off trail so you got to be careful know what area you're in know what kind of country you're looking at and keep track of yourself and where you're going definitely and know where the trail is and know what your boundaries are big stream over that way or highway over that way and keep uh, keep yourself oriented Heck, mushroomers are staring at the ground all the time. You don't want, you don't want to lose track of where you are and swing around and get lost, come out on the wrong road and walk a mile down a road in the wrong direction or something. Totally, that's a good point. I don't think that we talk about that enough in the mushroom world, like safety, because you hear about mushroom pickers getting lost. And, yeah, it uh, shows up in the news every year. Somebody gets too enthusiastic and goes 500,000 yards in the woods, and then they. <laughs> Yeah. decide to come back the wrong way <laughs> yeah do you use like any kind of a tracking app or you just have a good sense of direction or how um, do you i certainly look at the map uh to make sure i a hard it. map or you got one on your phone no the, the phones the backcountry maps the onyx and the uh backcountry navigator and or what's it what's the other one they yeah the, there's a lot of them yeah, yeah. there's a lot um some cal topo have, maps and cal topo is an interesting one because their website has Lots of layers. That one's good for checking out on the on the fires. Yeah, forest fire burns for yeah. morels in the spring. Uh, yeah, that'll that that'll give you updates on fires during the fire season. Yeah. So you're like, oh, that one's going getting bigger. <laughs> I like to use the. Um, I have an app called Strava on my phone. Strava. Strava. S T R A V A. 
So it's like, it was originally uh, for mountain bikers and then it went to hiking. Now you can snowshoe, ski, whatever, hike, take a walk in the forest. And it just tracks wherever you are. It overlays it onto other maps and onto Google uh, so really 3D was, images. It emphasized the, the actual trails. Just yeah. Trying to and it's actually saved us. We were morel hunting. The sun was going down. We, were, we, had, we either went back the way we came around this huge ravine or you know around this big valley or i was looking at strava and i was like i think we can cut straight through back to the truck and we put all our all our eggs in one basket and we just plowed into the wilderness and uh and we got went straight to the truck it was super yeah. duper cool but if your phone dies then that can create yeah uh, if, you wanna, if you're gonna do it on your phone you should probably have a spare battery and a cable so you can like go charge instead up. of one day which you know, maybe you're on the end of the day <laughs> on the charge. You might, yeah. It's good to have a battery take you through, particularly if, uh-oh, you'll run out of time and you start using the flashlight, that'll run down your phone real fast. And Good point. Hey, yeah. Paul's all about safety. We did. Right. Nobody's ever talked about safety on this channel, really, uh, So, but it's uh, it's important. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the old Mountaineers, uh, our neighboring famous outdoor club in Seattle, they go back twice as long as a mushrooming club. We The PMSMS started in the 60s. They started in, like, the 20s. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're the guys who invented uh, 10, 10 essentials for hiking. And you think, oh, I'm just, like, jumping out of my car and I go wandering down a trail. Well, you know... What thought you thought was a half an hour, one hour, uh, maybe turns into three, and then and then you get off trail, and you, so maybe you should re read that list yeah. for day hiking and remember the essentials, and you know an extra flashlight to get you down in the twilight is can make all the difference between sleeping under a tree and getting back to your car. So totally. yeah. what what do you carry like say right now with you, or, or are you right not now. really prepared? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not like going super deep into the forest here, but uh, right. but do you have like a compass or a whistle or anything oh, with you? Whistles, you... yeah, whistles are uh, handy. You know, your friend is over there, 50 yards, and you don't. You know, you don't like, blah, 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 blah. you know, you're trying to talk to them and they like, right, what? Yeah. So you start with some basic whistle signals. Yeah. And it seems to be fairly catching on fairly standard. Your club, our club, some of the guidebooks. Um, uh, one whistle just means, hi, okay. And the other guy whistles back one, hi, okay. Like, I'm here, yeah, I'm still here. Just like keep track of him as he wanders by the, behind that fallen log or that rhododendron and you didn't see him. Yeah. And two, uh, then you say, um, uh, like, come here. And his response, the other's response would be one. Okay, hi. And he's going to come over because you've got something interesting. You don't have to say, there's some foliot on a down log <laughs> down here by the street. You know, Tear your voice you up. You know, like, yeah. what? <laughs> and so they, uh, um, <laughs> so you, you call him over, then you start talking. And then yeah. you reserve three for, you know, I've, I've sprained my ankle or, you know, fallen. Three the toots of the whistle. Three toots like, of the whistle. Right. And, and you figure out who's got what whistle before you go. So you're like, oh, is that deep whistle? Is that Aaron over there? Yeah, that's Aaron over there. Right. You know? and agreed upon by the group you're working with. You could have different whistle signals, but you better, you know, know what they are be if, before you go. I think it's cool that all the clubs kind of have the same universal yeah, whistle signals. Yeah. And also, if you get separated from the club and you're stuck way out in the woods by yourself, like for me, like like a half a day of riding roller coasters and my voice is gone because I got kind of a low voice. So going, help, help, you know, is not going to get me very far. But a whistle, I can blow that thing all day long um, where right. my vocal cords would be blown out, you know. Right. So. On a roller coaster? You like roller coasters? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the mushroom. I think me and Paul there. just came across something. Whoa. Whoa let's see. It's uh, hidden there. Disguised. Look kind of the sky it looks like a big chunk of wood right yeah it's, it's and i didn't see it aaron spotted it that's uh uh the dyer's polypore the dyers like that stuff yeah um apparently you can get some nice yellows and browns and oranges out of it depending on how your chemistry you use and that's that's not what i'm talking about. Uh, i know much about but oh my hat today is made out of cool. natural dyes from mushrooms. From mushrooms, and I think there's some lichens involved. It does look like the colors that a dyer's yeah. polypore would make. Yeah, and, uh, some of those were, because this is what a really common thing. You can save that and they can use it. I, I understand that you can even use the old ones. I, I thought at first, oh, yeah. when I was collecting them, that they had to be fresh for the dyers and they, they know how to oh, yeah. draw the color out. I've yeah. heard that the more mature, actually, the darker pigments that they oh, can get. Oh, say that, maybe the, 
Yeah. In the dark. That's the old. Yeah, I was just. Faolus. Uh, I was up there at the International Fungi Fiber Symposium. Fiber Symposium that right here in the area this uh, this week. Did yeah. you go in? Oh, I had to. Uh, I was Drop. dropping off some people up there and uh, dropping off some mushrooms for them because. Cool. It's been such a dry year. The word went out to like get us some mushrooms because they need to be at a demo there. Yeah. They're, um, I heard it's pretty expensive to get in there. Oh, it's a, it's a, you know, all week and there's classes every day and there's, and they, they don't just walk. Classes about what? Uh, dyeing things, uh, making cloth, making paper. So all about his hat, Everything. all about this mushroom. And all about, and seven other mushrooms. There's different ways to right. get uh, dye colors from different mushrooms. Oh, wow. Look at that thing. There you go. Now that's an old one, man. He's, wow. That is gnarly. Look, it's like basically turned into wood. So before any real newbies out there ask, um, yes, you could eat that. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to like maybe put it in a pressure cooker for two hours. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's basically wood. It's at this in point. another category. That's uh, getting dye out of it. I don't think it's as yeah. Really gonna, yeah. That is pretty old, but I have heard the old ones. I mean, it's got moss growing on it. Yeah. That thing's a couple years old. Uh, that's not from this year, huh? And mm. the, the pore surface, which gets kind of, it's, you know, some irregular teased or pores, whatever. <laughs> so these are, the, these are the wrong trees for mushrooms like chanterelles, yeah? Yeah, this isn't their associates. Right. So these maple trees don't associate mycorrhizally with any mushrooms, and neither do uh, red cedar, which I, I say red cedar like one word because it is because they're not true cedars. But they uh, they don't they're like redwoods they don't have mycorrhizal partnership with other well the, the fungi. redwoods and the cedars have like uh, wax caps that like to grow near them That's or true. In the same groves it may not be with their roots but I understand that what it might be going on is the wax caps are with the mosses which are in the forest that cedars and redwoods tend toward so uh, there's uh -huh. actually a grove of cedars in Seattle where I get hundreds of the same wax cap growing and, oh, okay. and i thought oh yeah they're growing with the trees and everybody's like mm. no paul that's not how that works <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah what are you talking about they're saprobes <laughs> they're eating the they like the high acidic content and the scales from those cedars uh, or, and they they might be symbiotic with the mosses and not okay. the tree you know it's just like oh, how's that work and mm. that's i guess how, why they have wax caps in cedars and, and redwoods but also in ancient grasslands in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, well, that's not even close. Redwood and grass, that's, right. you know. Yeah. Well, but uh, if there's a moss or similar mosses that grow in those places, then the wax caps are so hanging out with those guys. So you think they're, they are, they need a, a partnership. They're not or just that, saprobes. Yeah, or maybe they just need the exact same environment. Yeah, I don't think it's all been worked out, or at least nobody's told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Look what we found, oh. Another saprobe. Yeah, this guy likes to eat the hardwood trees, the deciduous yeah. trees. What's, so what's one that of, one? Uh, oyster. Oyster uh, mushrooms like you find in the grocery store, you know? Yeah, this, uh, they usually like to grow those gray ones or the yellow ones because they're prettier. Yeah, yeah. The yellow one isn't even from North America, but it's starting to go wild like, apparently in the Midwest. Yeah, the golden oyster. Golden right? oyster. They, where's that from? Is that from China, I think? I, I'm really East Asia. Sure. They're beautiful, but... These ones yeah. probably Pleurotus pulmonarius, they're the white version. Yeah, they're or species number seven, we're calling them. Yeah. <laughs> species yeah, there's a little bit of the uh, recent efforts in the DNA has really brought out some interesting. Uh, Changed a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, wait a minute, maybe, maybe we have our own here. Yeah, so these are obviously like probably too dry. You wouldn't want to eat those that look like they had mold or something. But if you were in a real pinch, <laughs> I think you could still eat these ones. Yeah. It's a little bit go. better than that one we picked up. Oh, a lot of flies. That's one thing I find about wild oysters is that they're often just like riddled with bugs. Even if you don't see any, <laughs> they're probably still there. And like the whole like, oh, it's protein. That's cute and all until a worm like pokes out and waves at you when you're about to eat him. <laughs> oh, this one's super cool. Look, it's got a cap growing upside down its head. This one, there's a group. Oh. All right, a little bit of uh, deformity. Well, there's yeah. your there's, and there's the mycelium. Wow, there's the mycelium on the on the um, on the leaf litter, 
That's always important. What does it grow on? Is it on the tree? Is it in the litter? Is it in a chunk of wood that's hidden in the litter? What's going on? And this guy has a deformed cap. It has a cap coming upside down off the cap, which is generally called rose comb. You get these mutations that people are concerned it's been poisoned or something, but boy, some chanterelles just uh, do that in some, in some areas that yeah, you know, it's probably not evil level of poison. Maybe it just gets a little bit of something bad and it makes it grow funny, you know. Huh. Just a, That's a cool looking one. I'm gonna take just had a tough life. <laughs> so it grows funny. Huh. Very cool. What happens is the, uh, the fire comes through a young forest and medium age forest and a uh, one foot, two foot diameter one with uh, several inches of bark will survive, and everybody else will die off. This so big. He'll outlive the. He'll outlive the, his competitors, and uh, this guy's got six inches of bark. Oh yeah. And if the, even if a big fire comes through, yeah, it'll probably survive and keep on. You can see this guy's been through a few fires, it's like blackened on the bark, but inside of this guy doesn't care. Look at that; it's been burned. So these yeah, are big deal. These guys are fire resistant, huh? It's yeah, like look at that. Space shuttle tile on the outside of a tree. It's like very light. Doesn't conduct the fire through the heat through it. Crazy. Yeah. Well adapted. So this will survive everything in the under canopy will burn. Yeah, if it can get if it can get through the first fire too and it keeps growing and bark gets thicker, the other guys die, bark gets thicker, the other guys die, and this guy will be standing. You can see he's He's, uh, you know, five times as old as anything around him. I, oh, yeah. And I'm not seeing big... I mean, obviously, the log ears came through and changed things, too, but... Right. Why didn't they take this guy? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I've also heard so uh, the, the Doug fir cone seed won't germinate in this dark canopy down here, so it kind of needs a fire for the new seedlings to grow for oh, these yeah, Doug fir. So if you, if you go into a really big dug fir forest you'll be hard hard pressed to find uh, any saplings growing around it yeah. wow look oh wait a minute what we got here on this side of this tree here there's a lot of boy we're uh, dry dry <laughs> tomatoes there yeah it looks like turkey tail what do you think turkey tail yeah i think so. that's uh but it's got it's so falling apart it's like shedding just chunks of itself on the other ones below. And, yeah. And so it grows these beautiful flushes of Tremedes versicolor, uh, the turkey tail. Yeah. But uh, yeah, these are probably past their due. I, <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, if you were if you're desperate, you could probably make a tea and yeah, maybe you'd be all right. Uh, also, they. I think the craft folks use it. On these fleshy mushrooms, uh, these leathery ones, they there's some uh, fun paper making they do. With oh. the, you can grind it up, make it into a paste, and and make some uh, interesting uh, paper out of it. And a lot of apparently it's sort of something you can do with any of the softer polypores, the oh. softer end of the, not not a reishi, okay. <laughs> not a Ganoderma aplanatum you know that it's going to be hard to grind that one up yeah yeah <laughs> interesting so essentially it just gets made into a paste and then extruded into a paper form yeah huh? and then run out onto some uh, screen and then dried and, thin and and then you could draw a mushroom on it and you get maybe the, with the ink from the inky cap on the, the mud Ooh, yeah. come on man <laughs> Fuligo septica, dog vomit slime mold. Dog vomit slime mold. This stuff grows super duper fast, so if you want to do like quick time lapse, uh, you could put a cell phone here and leave it for an hour and you could see this pulsing like a heartbeat. Maybe creeping to the one direction or another. Like mm -hmm. you, come, you, you might not notice it, but it may shift by a half an inch by, by lunchtime. Very alive. Should I poke it? Touch it. See what happens. Touch it. <laughs> oh yeah so under there is all the spores the brown spores so the way sydney was uh, explaining this like it's set up so that when a raindrop falls it it goes bam it hits it and just spores fly everywhere just yeah like and uh, this is really dry but sometimes it's 
it barely hanging together. It's just it's just a pile of dust, a ground up chalk kind of stuff. And and you're you know, then I was surprised it even gave any resistance at all. So yeah, well, all mm -hmm. it needs is a raindrop, and then it's gonna break apart. And send it. Not technically a fungus. Right. right it's in a. They got its own kingdom now. The, the slimes, the molds. The slime mm -hmm. molds. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of molds are actually in the fungus kingdom, but not the slime molds, which. Do weird things with their cells and we have here. Look at oh, this. Oh, fresher. Freshy. Um, uh, Dyer's polypore. Uh, Phaola shrinites. It looks like a, like a type of a pastry, maybe. It's all furry. <laughs> pastry. Like, it, maybe you want to. You know, yeah, it looks like an apple fresh. fritter. Yeah, there you go. When it's fresher, even fresher, some of them have a like orange on the outside. But then when we saw those earlier ones, they're all dry and dark brown, and you don't recognize them. Right. Particularly if your book only has like a new one or an old one in it. Now this one we can look at the pores better. Yeah, let's have a look. We can get underneath it there. You don't like picking mushrooms? No, I don't know. No, we can. This one's all moldy, but I'll take it with. I'm I'm collecting dying mushrooms. Anyway, okay, so. yeah, we can if you're gonna collect actually use it. There we go. There's your actual what the pores, the spiky irregular polypore surface looks like. You can see yeah, how near the yeah. stem there, it uh, the pores just kind of climb down there. Cool, real green colored. Yeah. So you just throw that in a pot of hot water and boil it. And well, uh, the, the, you better talk to the folks at the at the fungus con for the. <laughs> the dying, uh, dying, dying conference up the road at the state park is, I don't know what the formula is. These things are super common, huh? Yeah, now see here we got one that's fresher and it's got yellow. Another Phaeolus schweinitzii. Phaeolus schweinitzii and it's more like you'd see in your book with the yellow edge and then orangey, yellow to orange to br light browns, where those things we saw earlier were all dark chocolate, uh, semi-sweet, uh, bitter <laughs> chocolate, cooking chocolate color, but they go through the whole changes. Yeah. Cool, another one. So these are really common this year. They don't Ooh. mind it uh, being dry out. No, and it's like the only the only thing we've been finding. Uh, yeah. Well, this has been nice walking around. Even in the dry forest, we got something. You know, there's always something to look at, fungus-wise. Uh, For sure. And talking about, like, safety and... That was interesting in forest habitat. So and the dying mushrooms and uh... we had a good walk. So I want to thank Paul again for joining Mushroom yeah. Wonderland on this episode, and uh, tons of videos coming out with all kinds of special guests. So honored to have you on here today. Yeah, good, was... good to see you back in the woods. We haven't seen you. So last time I saw you was in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We saw him in Telluride. If you watch that video. He's the guy with the Agaricon at the at the end of the parade. Yeah, so at the drum pretending table. to be Paul Stemmets, but uh, pulling uh, it off. Not everybody was picking up on my, my costume. <laughs> it was a subtle thing. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. That was such a good time. But anyways, thanks again. Hit that subscribe button and come back for the next episode of Mushroom Wonderland. Much love, everybody.